Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Miki Chaimovic. I'm VP Business Development with RSAP Vision, a global leader in computer vision and deep learning. For this webinar, I will host Moshe Zafran. Hey Moshe. Hi Miki. Moshe is not only our VP R&D, but he's also uh, relocating next month to the United States, to Silicon Valley, uh, to become the general manager of RSAP Vision uh, USA. So thank you, Moshe, for finding the time to be with us today. No problem. So a few words uh, about RSAP Vision. We are providing AI and deep learning solutions for image analysis. That's the only thing we do. We don't do uh, NLP or genomics or anything uh, other than image analysis. The solution is customized based on your project needs and your data set. Uh, this is a rather unique uh, approach in this market. We do not provide off the shelf uh, products or services that might or might not fit your exact needs, but rather we focus on you, on your project needs, we understand where you want to get, and we have a look at your data set, and then we customize, we tailor make a solution specifically for you. We've been doing that for over 25 years in this field with multiple repeat clients in the USA, as well, and we have extensive experience in all AI and deep learning techniques in numerous medical pharma applications. Here you can see uh, some of them. One second. Yeah, now they're moving. Um, you can see pathology, you can see microscopy, uh, OCT, fundus, uh, ultrasound, and many others. These days, we'll, uh, this webinar will speak mostly about CT, but we do all uh, modalities. We have an experienced team of 45 engineers located in Tel Aviv, Silicon Valley, and Boston, as well as a medical team in staff to guide solution development, including radiology, pathology, and more. So the bottom line is, in case you plan to develop an AI solution, RSAP Vision is the safest, most stable way to do it. Uh, we'll start the talk with a review of our AI-based uh, CT segmentation, for uh, which we call the full body segmentation. And I'll ask Moshe to uh, present it to you now. Hi, everyone. My name is Moshe. I'm going to tell you about uh, full body uh, segmentation from CT scans. So. Yeah, so uh, I love this slide. Uh, our uh, head of uh, medical imaging is always updating it and adding uh, more and more organs uh, uh, that uh, we can uh, uh, segment uh, from CT. So uh, this is a good opportunity to talk technology, but also to talk uh, a bit about uh, uh, sort of uh, the business aspects of this, uh, just uh, in a few words. So as Mickey uh, mentioned at the beginning, uh, our We uh, usually provide uh, Moshe, I, th I, think, I think we lost you for a second. Can you repeat the last sentence? Hi, Nikki. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, as as you mentioned, Mickey, uh, our DNA as a company really is uh, uh, providing custom tailored uh, solutions. Uh, basically, uh, uh, at least uh, uh, our uh, uh, sort of a, a basic uh, way of working with our clients is uh, as professional services form because the computer vision is a very wide, uh, very varied field, uh, especially in the medical domain. And each problem is uh, uh, special, each, uh, each device and each uh, specific needs call, call to, uh, calls for a specific uh, solution uh, with a, a very special and specific issues for each kind of data. That said, uh, what we've found over the course of, uh, of the last two years is that although what I said now is still true, and it's true even after the deep learning uh, revolution, even though everything's a neural network, it's still uh, not simple. Uh, Ron, our CEO, likes to say uh, that saying use neural networks is like saying you use software. Anybody can write software, but uh, it doesn't mean that anybody can write uh, good software or effective software. Uh, uh, that said, we uh, we, uh, we started out with uh, uh, some uh, uh, specific segmentation projects uh, for airways, which you can see in the uh, middle of the bottom row, and various other uh, 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 organs uh, related to chest and to the lungs. Uh, and what we're finding more and more is a repeated need uh, in the market for CT segmentation, not only of airways or lung fissures, et cetera, uh, but uh, of a very wide variety of organs, ranging from uh, you know, teeth, 
uh, for dental applications, uh, hip and knee joints uh, uh, for orthopedic surgery, uh, lesions, uh, which are very important uh, both in medical device applications, uh, biopsies, and uh, eventually a lesion ablation as well, and also in diagnostic applications for pharma, uh, uh, coronary arteries, uh, which you can see over here. And uh, what we found is that uh, uh, there obviously are very strong commonalities uh, between these tasks. So in the past, uh, before deep learning, uh, for each type of organ, you would develop a specific heuristic algorithm. The basic thing would be just to use thresholds. You have the house field units, and there's one value that supposedly represents bone or bone cortex. There's another value uh, that can represent uh, blood. And uh, maybe then you have an airway. So you say, okay, there's the outline of the airway. That's this lightish gray, and the inside is darker. Let's try to do something a little uh, more intelligent than thresholds. Let's try to make the threshold adaptive. Uh, Moshe, I think we lost you again. Hello, hello. Okay, I'm sure Moshe will uh, uh, come back to us in a second. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, I can just tell you that really uh, there is nothing better than just seeing it. Uh, there is hardly any organ and any type of organ in this uh, in the body that we cannot segment using CT. As Moshe said, uh, once you do one and the second and the third, you become much better in that, at, at that and uh, we can just uh, provide more and more. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, this is the uh, CT data scan, okay? I know you all know it. I just wanna show you, you know, the original, how it looks like before uh, uh, the, uh, the segmentation. Uh, some of you know how to read it, some of you don't know so well, but it doesn't matter. We can see that there's a lot of uh, uh, material uh, in there, a lot of data, okay? It's quite complicated. We're uh, uh, covering a significant part of the body. And uh, this is something that will prove uh, uh, very uh, relevant to the benefits of uh, AI uh, segmentation as we move forward. Here's another example. Uh, this example is of airways. Hello, Moshe. Yeah, guys, apologize for that. No problem, that's how it is. Uh, go to webinar. Uh, oh, sometimes fails us. Uh, okay, just uh, I just I covered the, the first slide with all the examples and I showed the CT uh, uh, data scan. And this is actually the first uh, example uh, of the airways. Um, what can we say about airways? Yeah, so so as, as I was uh, uh, as I think you heard before uh, my connection cut out. Uh, so uh, with the classical methods, really each type of segmentation was a project in its, on its of its own. It was very labor intensive. Uh, it was not enough to use uh, just thresholds. You need to do adaptive thresholds, and then you need to uh, deal with all kinds of edge cases, and it became very uh, complicated and convoluted and involved algorithms. Uh, and uh, what we found, uh, 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 what we found that over the past uh, few years is that uh, 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 deep learning and uh, architectures uh, such as uh, UNET, PSPNet, uh, architectures such as that, uh, let us uh, think of the segmentation problem, uh, of all these segmentation problems as cousins of each other. So it's still uh, not plug and play, you can't just stick your annotated data into the training system and get your model that's going to work right away. There are still specific issues uh, for different types of organs. Uh, so uh, uh, for airways, uh, for instance, you need uh, to uh, train the model and to augment the data in a way that will give you good results, both for the fine details and for the uh, coarse uh, uh, parts of the uh, tree, such as the trachea and the, uh, the two main branches. Uh, surprisingly, sometimes the problems are in the uh, coarse uh, uh, features that are easier to find rather than the fine features that you need to find a, a good way to make elegant and not start stitching uh, various algorithms uh, together. Uh, but really, uh, uh, this uh, domain of segmentation, uh, we've been very happy to find that uh, uh, is, is developing uh, into a, a whole suite of uh, uh, functionalities uh, that uh, from our point of view has actually become a product of our company. So we're still professional services for, firm. If you need to do uh, you know, uh, registration or some very specific classification uh, task, uh, then it's, uh, it's a project. Um, 
and it's uh, excuse me, it's a tailor-made solution. Uh, but for this specific domain of CT segmentation, the technology is already uh, very mature. And uh, although it's not uh, entirely plug and play, it's uh, very related technologies that are useful over a wide variety of uh, domains. So airway segmentation, as I said, uh, or as I hinted before, is used in medical devices uh, for uh, uh, lung biopsies to uh, navigate a bronchoscope uh, within the lungs, uh, uh, get to the correct uh, branch of the airway tree, uh, navigate uh, uh, precisely to a lesion, uh, and if you want to know where the lesion is, you need a, a segmentation of, uh, of uh, lesions and nodules uh, from the CT scan. Uh, and that's just uh, one application. So if you have a dental application or orthopedic segmentation application, it's going to be completely different. And again, a related technology, you can find the lungs and the lobes of the lungs, which we see uh, in the uh, different colors uh, in the 3D view, uh, finding the different lobes and knowing where the separation between them is and where the fissures that separate them are also very important in the bronchoscopy uh, procedure because uh, once you're in one lobe, uh, you cannot uh, puncture the fissure that's very dangerous uh, for the patient. So the user needs to be informed uh, at all times, uh, both where they are in the uh, uh, bronchial tree, as well as uh, getting an additional safety indication of where they're not allowed to go uh, with the scope. Yeah, so, uh, okay, in the next slide, we can see uh, blood vessels in chest CT and a uh, uh, tumor in chest CT, which is needed uh, for navigation. And again, uh, during bronchoscopy, you want to know where the blood vessels are, uh, and there are other applications uh, 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 for this uh, segmentation that are uh, completely unrelated uh, to the bronchoscopy uh, application. Uh, okay, so in the next slide, uh, there are lung tumors, and uh, the similar technology can be used for multi-class segmentation of brain tumors. And this is a diagnostic uh, application. This is to measure uh, the uh, volume of the tumor, the volume of the surrounding edema, uh, etc. Uh, so it's really applying uh, this to uh, many different uh, use cases, uh, both for medical devices as well as for diagnostic applications. Yeah, uh, th this uh, uh, naively, this uh, whitish area in the view uh, we can see on the uh, uh, middle uh, slice uh, shown of the CT. Uh, I know by an untrained eye might also be uh, mistaken for an oddly shaped tumor, but this is actually a brain hemorrhage. Uh, it has different characteristics and uh, different appearance. Uh, so again, CT segmentation technology uh, uh, of similar type can be applied for uh, uh, application of follow-up for hemorrhage patients. Uh, they need multiple scans to be done uh, within uh, relatively short periods of time. And uh, the quantification here is very important. You need a way to measure the exact volume uh, of the uh, hemorrhage and of the uh, surrounding uh, uh, artifacts that are uh, results of this hemorrhage uh, and to follow up uh, uh, over time. Uh, in order to uh, gauge the patient's responses to various treatments and to help the doctor choose uh, the treatment. And automating the segmentation is obviously saving a lot of time uh, for radiologists and also uh, can achieve more accurate results. These are just examples of uh, 3D models. So you have both the hemorrhage as well as the ventricles themselves, as well as blood in the ventricles, uh, which is a, a different class. Uh, this is an example of bone segmentation of the knee joint. Uh, so here, uh, unlike for the airway tree, you don't only need to separate the object uh, uh, from the background within the CT scan to go from a, a volumetric data that's in gray levels to a 3D model. You also need to separate the bones from each other. Uh, generally, uh, knee replacement uh, uh, patients uh, can have all kinds of uh, 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 strange uh, uh, artifacts and the cartilage can be very thin, the bones can be very close to each other, uh, so uh, you need uh, what's called instant segmentation. It's not enough to do semantic segmentation. This is a different example of a hip joint and uh, we've expanded this already to uh, many other orthopedic applications uh, such as uh, uh, spine vertebra and uh, teeth, which are also uh, a cousin of this. Uh, again, if you just use a simple threshold and simple heuristics afterwards to count the teeth and try to separate them, uh, then the results will not be nearly as robust. Uh, we can see in the lower right uh, uh, the foot, uh, all the foot bones as well separated from each other. Uh, and again, uh, uh, the machine learning technologies uh, let you get a must, much more robust uh, solution. Obviously, if you see the, uh, the little bones in the ankle joint, then uh, uh, the separation 
is, I mean, we can see it by eye because uh, our uh, visual system knows how to generalize and knows how to do uh, all kinds of uh, 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 non-trivial analyses of the data that it's seeing. Uh, but if you just uh, do some sort of edge detection or even, uh, you know, mathematical models uh, for uh, some sheet that's separating the bones, it's still not going to be uh, nearly as robust as the, as the machine learning based technologies, which are trained on the proper uh, data set. This is a different example. This is related orthopedic uh, uh, application to detect landmarks uh, in the hip joint and in the knee joint. Uh, this actually is already not part of the segmentation uh, product, so to speak, um, but uh, it's uh, added on on top of the uh, bone segmentation. I think I discussed this one in a different webinar. Excellent. Thank you very much, Moshe, for this uh, uh, review. Um, so, so far we've shown you uh, uh, CT segmentation of, of different parts of the body. Uh, as Moshe said, you know, we've done many of them and we can do more because as the, uh, the more we deal with it, the better uh, we get. Uh, I would like uh, to do two, two things actually. The first one is to use this opportunity to encourage you to send us questions. Uh, we have a Q&A session at the end of the, se uh, of the talk and we'll be happy to answer uh, all of your questions. So if there's anything that you would like to know based on what uh, we discussed so far, please do uh, send us your question and we'll be happy to answer them. The second one is that I'd like to speak uh, a little bit about the benefits of AI-based uh, uh, city segmentation, namely the benefits for you as uh, providers of uh, medical devices and the benefits to your users okay once they have an AI solution uh, integrated into the uh, medical device so uh, generally speaking we've talked about segmentation and we saw a few examples of classification and as Moshe mentioned uh, during uh, the previous slides uh, there is also a significant uh, potential for quantification so when we're talking about AI solutions usually we'll uh, have these three uh, in attendance uh, quantification specifically basically means that once we've segmented something and we classified it uh, we now put a number on it and the number could vary it depends on the medical device it depends on the scenario uh, it could be the length as you can see in this example it could be the volume uh, if we're talking about pathology it could be the number and density of uh, specific cells uh, in the slide it could be many things <clears throat> but it's very important to keep that in mind because these things are uh, very easy easy once you have segmentation and classification in place and there is a lot of benefit in them as I'll show you uh, in a second and again uh, as Moshe said we can do that pretty much for all organs uh, lesions nodules tumors whatever is in there we can implement all these three uh, uh, things when I speak about AI benefits, uh, again, they change between the different scenarios, okay? Some of them are scenario specific, but oftentimes uh, there would be uh, the, the main three, okay? Or the ones that I can pr pretty much guarantee are uh, saving time, reducing the number of errors, and improving uh, clinical insights. So uh, we've, we've discussed that uh, uh, at length at one of our previous uh, webinars, but I would like to uh, run through it uh, uh, quickly and, uh, and tell you a little bit uh, about it. So uh, the first thing is uh, saving time. Uh, it's important, of course, by definition, okay, because once we have uh, the the medical device uh, used then uh, you know there is a user there and the user wants to save time whether it is uh, in a clinical scenario maybe he's treating a patient and maybe it's a research uh, scenario but in both cases uh, reviewing the scan takes time once we have segmentation cl classification and quantification in place uh, then we can uh, save a lot of time for instance if you look at these uh, images of ct then you can see or maybe you can see because it's very small there is a small red dot somewhere in there now think about it from the user's point of view that he needs to uh, scan through or this uh, uh, entire chest in order to find those uh, small things that are of interest to him uh, let's assume these are uh, tumors in this uh, scenario okay obviously it takes time but once as we can see on the right we have segmentation and classification in place then it becomes much easier 
it becomes a map for the user to use. He can see exactly what's there. He can see where it is. Uh, the red ones are the tumors in this case, which are of importance to him. The uh, green ones are nodules, which are not so important to him. So the, you, you can see he can benefit from the classification. And the, the blue is just water in the lungs, which he can disregard at this stage, okay? So once I give him this map, obviously I save a lot of time for him. Another benefit we've mentioned is the potential for reducing the number of errors. And I say potential because theoretically one can claim that, you know, maybe there aren't uh, any errors. But, uh, you know, if you worked in this industry for a while, then you know that uh, two errors is human, everybody makes mistakes, and uh, the, the medical industry as a whole uh, uh, invests a, a lot in reducing this, uh, the number of mistakes because of the repercussions associated with them. One of those errors, uh, again, for uh, it's a good example in this scenario, would be a misdiagnosis if we're missing the tumors. So again, if you look at the photos, okay, at least to my eyes, there is nothing there, okay? And it's very easy to think, okay, we've, we've seen that, it's all clear, let's go, you know, Mr. Patient, you can go home. But once I have the segmentation in place, then I know that there is something there. Okay, I know that there is something there. Now, I don't expect the user to <clears throat> to to uh, uh, cancel his opinion uh, against uh, the AI solution. It, that's not what we're there for. We are there to help him uh, verify that indeed he can see everything that is worth uh, seeing. So. Once he can see that there's something there, then he can zoom in, as you can see in these photos, and then you can see a bit more clearly that there is a white area there that does look suspicious. Now, again, the final word is of the user, okay? I'm not telling him what to say, but I am giving him the tool, uh, again, to save time doing so and to make sure that he's 100% uh, uh, sure that there are no uh, mistakes. Uh, partial diagnosis is, of course, uh, another problem, which means that, you know, we've, we found the, the, the main tumors, but we're missing the secondary tumors. And there are many other examples. And again, once we discuss uh, the, the, reduce, the reduction of errors, we, sh we should understand that it's straightforward to the reduction of the repercussions of those errors. As people who work in this industry, surely you know that these would include uh, clinical repercussions, financial repercussions, and oftentimes also legal repercussions and even more so the combination of, of uh, all of the above, okay? So once we've provided the user with a tool to reduce the errors, we saved him a lot of trouble and we uh, provided a significant uh, value. Lastly, uh, improving clinical and research insights. Uh, and in this example, I'll discuss accurate quantification of scores such as RESIST. Uh, this is just a context. This is just an example. Okay, I just didn't want to just throw in uh, uh, buzzwords. I wanted to show you something real, but I think that uh, it's pretty straightforward to see how uh, 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 similar processes that you're dealing with would benefit from such a capability. So we've done the segmentation, we've done the classification, and uh, to the left, you can see that we can now m accurately measure the tumor. Now, it's very important as part of the RECIST score. The RECIST score is basically uh, <coughs> uh, focused on, on measuring the, the tumors in order to track their growth as we uh, go along with the treatment. Okay. Now, it's not so easy, even if you, if you know that the, the, the tumor is there, it's not so easy to estimate its length because it's not just, you know, the, uh, uh, that you look at it from one angle. What they define as length is the, the longest line that you can we run through the tumor in any angle, okay? So that would take time and that would oftentimes end up with an inaccurate estimation of the length. But once you have an AI solution in place, then the, the quantification is very easy. It's with, a, uh, with one click, you can get the exact length of that uh, tumor, in this case, 62.14 millimeters, okay? Which is of course of uh, clinical value. And it saves a lot of time 
to the right, you can see that, that these measurements need to, to be taken uh, throughout the treatment uh, period. And sometimes there are uh, there is more than one tumor. So <clears throat> if you calculate the numbers, you can see a significant uh, difference uh, and a significant value both in time saving and in a clinical insight. It's just, uh, you know, you know better what's really happening with the patient. But it's not only the things that, that they are required to do, okay? Resist tells you you need to measure the length. Uh, it doesn't tell you that you need to measure the volume. However, there is evidence in research that tumor volume reduction rate is superior to resist for predicting the pathological response of rectal cancer. Okay, so that's great. It means that even if I'm not obligated to measure it, I would like to measure it in order to uh, know more about the patient. That's wonderful. But have a look at these things. Okay, these are tumors. Now, let's say I, I, I understand the, the importance of calculating the volume. How do you calculate accurately the volume of something that looks like that? Honestly, you can't. Uh, these are not spheres. These are not... Uh, perfectly shaped boxes. These are strange looking creatures with all kinds of spines and spikes and protrusions. And to, to say that you can accurately uh, measure the volume uh, just by you know looking at it is uh, a bit uh, out of place. Uh, so if I didn't have an AI solution, there was an, a lot I could do with this recommendation of you know measure the volume. But once I do have an AI solution in place, and I just, with a click of the button, I can just get an accurate uh, measure, a measurement of the volume. So I can tell you that the one on the left, for instance, is 3,887 uh, square millimeters, and the one on the right is 6,275. It didn't take me time. I didn't make, make any mistake, and it was just uh, uh, one click of the button. And again, this is of clinical uh, value. So we've spoken about AI benefits. Again, we can pretty much guarantee that uh, we will be saving you time, we will be reducing the number of errors, and we will be improving clinical insights. Uh, and even more so, with different scenarios, there are oftentimes additional benefits that are uh, less generic than these three, but are still uh, very valuable. This example is here to tell you that even though, you know, we've spoken uh, for, for that part of the talk about a specific uh, scenario, you know, lungs, tumors, a resist score, and so on and so forth, uh, as Moshe said beforehand, we can do that to pretty much every organ in the body. Uh, here you can see liver and tumor. Uh, tumors in the liver, it could be different organs, it could be things that are not tumors. Uh, pretty much whatever you, you are focusing on, you want to measure, you want to segment, uh, it's very much uh, possible. Again, a reminder, please do send us uh, your questions. Uh, and uh, now I'll discuss our solution uh, development process. Uh, usually, if you've been with us uh, beforehand, you know that we presented at the beginning, but oftentimes, you know, people miss the beginning. So we decided to put it uh, more towards the end, uh, just uh, before the Q&A session. So just a few words about that. Firstly, as we've mentioned before, this is not a standardized uh, product or uh, solution, okay? Uh, the more we do, the easier it is for us to do the next project for you. And in most cases, <clears throat> the things that we're asked to do are pretty similar to things we've already done. And yet, we always uh, begin with a proof of concept. And the reason for that is, A, that we want you to get a better understanding of what this AI buzzword can do for you. Okay, you've heard about it, you read about it, you know all kinds of stuff, but does, is it really helpful for me? Then we want you to positively answer that question. The second one is because the, these projects are very different from one another, uh, uh, when you just approach me for the first time, it's very hard for me to estimate how long it will take, what will be the cost associated, and so on and so forth. So. The proof of concept helps us to answer uh, both these issues, okay? We do something initial that uh, enables us to learn more about your project and enables you to see how it will look like at the end of the development process. 
<coughs> sorry, it all starts when we sign a mutual NDA CDA. You know, we want to, to have a, an open conversation about the things that really matter to you uh, and, uh, and so on. And then we define what parameters and deliverables are needed from the POC. Again, this would not be the final, uh, uh, the final uh, parameters and deliverables of the uh, complete and, and uh, solution, but it would be enough in order to show you what the fuss is all about. Uh, and then the customer provides a few samples. Now, this is important. I know many of you at this stage, especially if they're at the, the beginning of the development process, they don't necessarily have too many samples. And it's something we've discussed uh, uh, plenty uh, over the last uh, webinars, and we will keep mentioning it because it's really important. It's important to say that in order to start the process, you don't need too many samples. Okay, so don't uh, have a, the, a limited number of samples limit your uh, uh, journey to an AI solution. Give us a call, we'll see what we can do with those samples, and in many cases, you can definitely have a good proof of concept, even if the number of samples is limited. Another thing that often uh, uh, um, uh, is, is of issue uh, for uh, customers is uh, the, the annotations. And yes, definitely, in order to uh, develop a good uh, operational uh, deep learning based uh, system, you do need annotations. But again, you don't necessarily need too many of those. And this is something that we can really help you with. Okay, we have an annotation team uh, in house, we uh, have a semi annotation, uh, semi automatic annotation tools, we can take a lot of that burden off your uh, shoulders. We would like to, you to be involved and to okay everything, but this is really uh, something we, we take care of. So this would take, uh, you know, how long it would take. Uh, once uh, we have everything, then we can start uh, uh, developing the POC level solution. Uh, this would usually take a few weeks, a month or two. It all depends on the project. Uh, sometimes we've done something like what you need. So, you know, there, it will be uh, redundant. We can just, you know, move on, move on to the next stage, but uh, uh, at any rate, uh, this uh, stage is uh, by all means irritative, uh, iterative, sorry, uh, namely that we want you in line, okay? We are doing this for you, uh, and so we always have weekly discussions and updates regarding the development. If there's anything to discuss, then we're discussing. This is something that we're doing for you and with you. Once we've uh, uh, finished the, developing the POC, we present it to you, we present it to your managers, to the stakeholders in your organization, to whoever needs to know. And at that stage, of course, we can, we, since we know more about the project, we can uh, uh, give you the quotation and we can estimate how long uh, it will take. Once the green light is given, then we just uh, sit down and develop the full, the complete uh, solution. Again, this is an iterative process that includes uh, weekly discussions and updates regarding the solution development. It can be two months, it can be six months, it all depends on the project. Uh, we have, we've had customers who started, you know, with one, uh, with version one, and then they moved to version two and version three and so on and so forth, because they really saw the value. Uh, but, but but for having a, a, a basic AI solution that is customized, like tailor-made for your medical device, you don't need too many months. Okay, as you can see, this whole process can take less than uh, six months, which means that uh, pretty much by the end of this year or the end of Q1 uh, next year, you can have an up and running operational AI solution as part of your medical device. Excellent. So I think we've reached our uh, Q&A session. Uh, again, uh, this uh, is a good opportunity to tell you to send your questions. Okay. Uh, one second. Let me have a look at the questions we were asked. Just a second. Okay, uh, let me just read it for a second because it's relatively long. Don't know, Jimmy. One second. Um, okay, I, I think we've answered those questions, but but still, uh, Moshe, we, we're being asked if we can segment uh, each and every uh, uh, organ in the body. What do we say to that? 
Uh, each and every is a very wide definition, but basically uh, everything we've tried so far, or everything that we've been able to, uh, uh, we've we've had the opportunity to annotate uh, a sufficient data set for. Um, so some are more challenging, some are less challenging. For instance, uh, uh, nodules are harder uh, uh, to build tumors because the density is very low and it's sort of uh, hard to see. So for that, you need more data. Um, but we, as of as of yet, we have not run up to any uh, uh, limitations of this technology. As far as uh, we haven't really found anything that uh, you know, uh, you and I, or at least a trained radiologist, can see that this technology has not been able to tackle uh, uh, given the proper uh, training set. I understand. Okay. Um... Another question here is, uh, and that's an, another uh, question that uh, often uh, comes up uh, with uh, medical uh, device uh, focused webinars. Uh, do we need an FDA approval uh, for our AI uh, solutions? In general, yes. In general, uh, uh, when our client uh, integrates their solution into a medical device or into some uh, diagnostic workflow, they're going to need uh, FDA approval. Uh, exactly what they need will very much depend on the application. Uh, uh, medical device, uh, you know, used in a surgical procedure or, uh, you know, semi-invasive type of procedure uh, needs uh, uh, one level of certification and a diagnostic tool uh, for a clinical setting also needs a very high level of certification. Uh, if you're using a diagnostic tool in a research setting, you know, or, uh, or something like that, you may need a, a low level of certification, but there or in general, there's always going to be uh, some uh, regulatory uh, uh, approval that's uh, going to be needed. And uh, we support that uh, in terms of doing all the statistics and the experiments and the validation work and uh, uh, reporting on it in a very uh, organized manner. Thank you, Moshe. I'll just add to that uh, to clarify that uh, uh, the FDA approval is not given to our solution as a standalone, okay? Uh, it is considered part of the medical device and it goes through the process as part of the medical device. So in this sense, it's not like we need to prove to the FDA that, uh, you know, uh, the AI solution is perfect or uh, that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're dodging uh, the, the, the human beings in favor of the machine. Okay, this is not what we're talking about. Uh, everybody understands that this is something that is uh, uh, supposed to help the user. It doesn't replace the user. And uh, this also influences the way the FDA uh, uh, deals with that. Uh, so, you know, if you've heard all kinds of... Uh, important uh, point. Again? Sorry, yeah. important. I just said it's an important point. Sorry. Yeah. Because uh, if you've heard all kinds of things about, you know, issues that Google are having with their autonomous car and all kinds of things like that, this is not what we do, okay? We're not uh, robotizing the world. We're providing people with uh, smart tools to help them. Uh, and the FDI, FDA understands that, okay? So we've had uh, AI solutions run through the FDA process without any uh, particular problem. Um, so so like even, even if it's fully automated and uh, you never uh, really need to intervene uh, because it, it works automatically, you still, uh, you don't present it as, uh, you know, from the uh, uh, automotive world, you wouldn't present it as a quote unquote level five uh, type of thing that's driving itself. Uh, you'd say, okay, this is an automated tool, and then we have a user uh, looking at this result uh, and approving it. Uh, so uh, it's it's you you frame it more as like an ADAS type of a, a system, as, as driver assistance or user assistance. Uh, however, in practice, uh, the users really uh, are not going to need to make all kinds of clicks uh, and to correct it. They're just going to need to approve it. Excellent. Um, another question. Uh, 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 have you done any projects in Conbeam CT? Uh, Moshe, what do we say to that? Yes, yes, we're working uh, uh, right now on a, a project uh, involving Conbeam CT, and uh, uh, there are challenges uh, there because there's, uh, uh, in some cases at least, there's a lot more noise than a preoperative uh, CT, uh, so then you need to. Uh, and, and you need to acquire uh, data, you know, in the correct modality. If you can't acquire enough data from Conebeam, then uh, you would take a, a regular CT and you try to, uh, you know, simulate uh, the noise and the various artifacts that you uh, find in the Conebeam CT. 
Uh, so yeah, we're very familiar uh, uh, with this type of data. Excellent. Uh, you, get less, and you get less contact uh, sometimes because the field of view is smaller. There's there's specific issues you need to deal with, but it's it's very relevant for the segmentation technology. Excellent. Uh, to measure the volume of tumor of irregular shapes, are you using fuzzy logic? Uh, Moshe, do we need to use uh, fuzzy logic? Um, in, in general, um, so I'm not sure exactly what you mean by uh, uh, fuzzy logic, but uh, usually we would measure the uh, volume of a uh, binary segmentation. So the uh, a neural network or neural network plus pros uh, plus uh, post-processing uh, will give you a binary mask. Each voxel is either part of the tumor or not part of the tumor. Sometimes you can do, you know, a little uh, interpolation type of thing along the edges uh, to make the boundary smoother, and then perhaps you can get uh, a bit more refined uh, volume estimate uh, in that way. But uh, in general, it's based on a binary segmentation, and uh, it's some variant of just uh, counting the voxels. Um, there. There are ways to get a confidence score out of these uh, uh, networks uh, if you have enough data, um, but usually, in any case, the user just wants a yes or no answer for each voxel. Excellent. Uh, so I'll, I'll just add to that that uh, you know wh when we say that you know quantification is the is the next stage beyond segmentation and classification, this is exactly what we mean. We basically take the entire scan, and for every voxel in the scan, we have segmented it and classified it as A or B or, or C. So the quantification is very much straightforward in the sense that when you ask for the, uh, the volume of something, they, we just you know sort of calculate all the voxels that are related to that uh, something. So it could be uh, this tumor or that uh, 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 or this nodule or whatever it is. Okay, so it's it's pretty much straightforward. Uh, and and again, this is an important message because if you are thinking about an AI uh, solution and you're thinking about segmentation and you're thinking about classification. I do encourage you to think about quantification. Okay, it oftentimes it's it's really straightforward, and as we saw beforehand, uh, there are a lot of benefits associated with it. Um, excellent. Uh, I think we're pretty much uh, pretty we're pretty much in time. Uh, there is another question here. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, how do we sort of optimize, uh, you know, the design and the structure of the AI solution? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, and actually, we're planning to discuss it in one of our next webinars. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll save the answer uh, to that uh, webinar, um, which is a good opportunity to uh, tell you actually, uh, and to encourage you to follow us uh, on various uh, um, social network platforms. If you want to know more about uh, our uh, next webinars, we usually have a webinar every two weeks or so. Um, you can drop us an email and we'll be happy to uh, uh, notify you by mail regarding the next webinar, or you can follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter or YouTube or Facebook. Uh, we're, we're there, so whatever uh, is more comfortable uh, for you. Uh, I know we haven't managed to answer all of the questions, but I'm afraid we're pretty much uh, running out of time. So I encourage you, uh, uh, if you have additional questions or if you have a question that was not answered, feel free to uh, contact us directly. We're happy to uh, discuss it offline. Uh, we're here for you. We're always happy to uh, talk to people. This is what we do and we love it. And uh, I think that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much, Moshe. Thank you. And thank you very much, everybody, for attending. And uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good day.